Hi, I'm Heather Paduska, founder of the Brand Star Academy, where I teach entrepreneurs how to be powerful, profitable speakers and create their own celebrity personal brands. Welcome to Thrive, the show where I bring you tips, resources, and people to help you create a more abundant life and business. You're in for high value content coming to you from industry leaders who are growing their business, making an impact, and rocking their brands. And I'm so excited to have my guest here today, Dan Janelle, is the founder and president of P. PR Leads Expert Resource Network, where he helps businesses build their brands with books. He himself has written more than a dozen books, including his newest work called Write Your Book in a Flash, which has already reached number one best-selling status. As a publicity and marketing expert, Dan has helped more than 10 thousand authors and experts expand their brands and has handled PR assignments for major corporations such as IBM, Reader's Digest, American Express, and more than a hundred other high-tech companies. He was even on the PR team that launched AOL and is considered one of the founding fathers of the internet. When Dan helps leaders and executives write their books, he helps them take their business to the next level and expand their influence. Dan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Heather. It's a pleasure to meet you and to be with you and to help your readers and your listeners. So thank you. Oh, well, thanks. That's quite a resume. Can you tell us and, and our listeners a little bit, how, how did you get that accomplished resume going? <laughs> what is the story? Oh, wow. Well, I, I was a poor kid growing up, and I was lucky enough to get to Northwestern University because mm -hmm. I thought I was going to write the great American play, not the great American novel, but mm -hmm. the great American play. And I saw all these people majoring in English, and I thought, well, they can dissect Moby Dick and Herman Melville, but they don't know about real life. So I majored in journalism. Mm -hmm. So I was a newspaper reporter in West Virginia and Florida and uh, New York State. And then from New York, uh, well, I was in New York uh, State, I interviewed a PR guy who had invented, or rather who had done the PR for just about every high-tech invention since World War II, and he offered me a job. So the next thing I knew, I was doing high-tech PR at the very dawn of the computer industry. Wow. So I was representing companies like Commodore and Kpro. I introduced the CD-ROM encyclopedia, uh, which was the first piece of uh, software for the CD-ROM industry. Now you don't even have CD-ROMs anymore, so my time has come and gone. But you live, you learn, you grow, and uh, I knew about the, the, the online world, so because of AOL and America Online, mm -hmm. so I wrote the first book about marketing on the internet back in 1993. That's when Al Gore and I were like the only people online. Wow. And that led to speaking engagements literally all over the world, from Beijing to Budapest. Mm -hmm. uh, I've written 13 books since then, and it really launched my career. So that's the first takeaway here. A book can launch your career. I wrote my first book in 1991. It was called How to Publicize High-Tech Products, and I uh, spoke at the Software Publishers Association. Mm. And at the end of the talk, there would be always be two people at the end of the room saying, can I talk to you? I want you to do PR for me. So the book made me stand out from everyone else doing PR. Mm. And for everyone listening to this show, there are many, everyone has competitors. Everyone, no matter how good you are, no matter how varied and, and re, how many resources you are, no matter how good you think you are, the universe lumps you all together because you all went to college, you all have degrees, you, mm -hmm. all, you all have good clients and good experiences. So what sets you apart? You're an author, you have a book. That could be the one thing that makes you stand apart. So I believe that books help you build your brand and they're a great publicity source and it's a great way to get new business and a book also helps you raise your fees because you're seen as the expert. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true and I think a lot of entrepreneurs especially are like, I gotta write my book, I gotta write my book but they don't know what is the right book to write first. So what do you say about that? If you, if you have more than one book idea, what is the book that you should start with if you're trying to use it for building your brand and your business? You actually answered the question. You have to ask yourself, what is the purpose of this book? If it's to release your inner angst and talk about your childhood difficulties and why you can't get along with your brother or your sister, that's not the book that's gonna get you any business. Mm. If it's an encyclopedia book that tells everything you know about this certain industry, well, no one wants to read an encyclopedia anymore. A book has to be so short that people can pick it up when they get on the plane in New York and finish it by the time they, the plane lands in Los Angeles. People just don't have long attention spans anymore. You need to write a short book. But the focus of the book has to be on something that makes people, when they finish it and put it down, they say, I like him, 
I know him, I trust him, I want to do business with him. Mm -hmm. So you collect all of your stories, your ideas, and you go at it from a marketing point of view and say, what do my clients, my future clients need that I can share with them that helps them get to know me better so they want to work with me? Uh, so I have a question around that. Yeah. You were saying don't write about you know your dog that died and your your you know your high school sweetheart, <laughs> but brand story is such an important yeah. part of building your brand. So how do you how do you feel and think about including narrative and brand story to build that rapport with your audience and still make it a valuable marketing tool? Oh, the two are not mutually exclusive. I don't want to hint about that. Yeah. I remember. And brand story is so important. I remember one time at the National Speakers Association, I was in a, uh, a, a story creation workshop, and the leader of the uh, group uh, called on someone and said, tell me a story, tell me a story about your grandmother. And a guy stood up, he said, well, I, I really like my grandmother. And said, what do you like about your grandmother? Well, she made these cookies for me, and he told the story about how he walked into the room and he smelled these cookies and the aroma, and every time he smelled that cookies, it, it just reminded him of the grandmother. And the guy who led the seminar, his name was Lee, he said, so what's the point to that story? And the guy said, I don't, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know if there is a point to the story. <laughs> and Lee looked at a person and said, well, audience, what was the point of that story? And he said, oh, smells can trigger emotions. That's right. He said, what else is the purpose of that story? He said, oh, he really loves his grandmother and is a really family-oriented person. And he called on four or five other people, and they came up with four or five other lessons that they learn from that little simple story. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you want to talk about your dog, because the dog taught you about loyalty, and it's all about being loyal to your customers, mm -hmm. then you have a story that relates to your brand, that makes you more personable, and get your story out there and builds that know, like, and trust factor so they want to work with you. Yeah, I'm really glad you said that because I work with a lot of people on their story as well. and. I, I went to a conference a couple years ago where people were telling their stories and it wasn't connected to their business. Like mm -hmm. you can tell a story about your grandmother and their cookies, but unless you can connect that to the value that you bring to your audience, it's not the right story, in my opinion. Yeah, so. that, that's true. But you'd be surprised at this technique we have in PR called bridging. Yeah. And it's like, we can talk about the cookies and I relate it to customer loyalty. Yes. So I might have like, that might be my superpower mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of saying, no, you really have a great story oh, here. Okay, Don't cool. throw that away. Yep. Let's see where we can go with this. Mm -hmm. And then you have fun with it. Mm -hmm. But if you want to talk a story about your dog and how he died and how sad it made you feel, you'd be surprised. In the online world, you get more feedback talking about your dog or your cat than you would about some new business process that you created. Mm -hmm. so people really want to have relationships with people they buy from these days. Mm -hmm. So the more personal you can be in telling your brand story, it just works. But if you can tie it in, if you can tie in the logic and the emotion, then you have that double play that just cements them to you because we buy on emotion and we justify on logic. I'm not the first person to say that. It's been proven. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would believe you if you said it because you have so many impressive credentials if you said that. But I have a question about that because a lot of people in marketing say, tell your story online, be personal, be, you know, tell the story about your dog. And I think a lot of people are out there doing that, but they're not converting from it. They're building a lot of likes, a lot of audience members, but they're not necessarily converting their ideal clients. They're not actually making money from their story because they haven't bridged that. They haven't found that. So what would be an, an example of someone um, that they could use a tool when they're, when they're thinking, okay, I'm going to write my story. What would they maybe think about to bridge that gap to their audience that are buyers? Well, ask your buyers what they need and what they want and what their biggest problems are. Mm -hmm. And that's what you bridge to. Mm. So I love my grandmother. I, every time I think of my grandmother, I think of those cookies. I think of that warm smell and that, that inviting smell I had when I went into her kitchen. It's just like you... In fact, you open up the front door, you can just smell that beautiful aroma of the cookies coming in. And isn't that the kind of feeling you want when your clients walk into your office and your supermarket or your bakery or your law firm? Don't you have to feel that, that they look around, they see this is trust, they, they, they see the diplomas on the wall, they, they, they can see that the, the appointments are very neat and orderly, that the, your receptionists are friendly and inviting, that you create this whole atmosphere that people just know the minute they walk in the door, just like you walked into the door with your grandmother, you had this warm enveloping feeling, that's the kind of feeling we can bring to your office when you hire us to bring to do your 
interior decorating, to do your painting, to do your remodeling, mm -hmm. to do your uh, employee training. Mm -hmm. So it can work to a lot of different things. That's the bridging. Yeah, so I you love find that. out what do they need, what can you provide, because that's what they really want. Mm -hmm. And the brand story is that emotional factor that makes it all come together. So you need the bridge. The bridge is key. I love that. I love that. Right. Otherwise, you're just talking to yourself. You're saying how wonderful you are, and they're saying, well, that doesn't connect with me. The brand story makes the connection. Or it's just a story that's a nice story, but isn't necessarily driving your business in a certain way. Exactly. So that's yeah. when I say when you write your book, you say to yourself, what is it that your clients need? Because the only reason they're going to buy your book is to solve a need. They're not going to buy your book because to help you out or to, of course, they have an extra $20 in their pocket. They're buying your book because they have a problem. They have problems with their accounting, with their hiring, with their employee engagement, with their raising their kids, whatever. And they say, this book can help me have happier, healthier kids. And I'm a psychologist and I can help you have happier, healthier kids. And I'm going to show you how. And here's my book with 10 steps. Then you have it made and you weave in your stories, your brand stories and examples. You know, a lot of times people get stuck with their books because they have their signature story, you mm -hmm. know, the, the cookie story, the grandmother story. That's mm -hmm. it. They say, now what do I do? I have 120 pages to fill. <laughs> well, I've created a mnemonic called Describers mm. and uh, they stand for things like descriptions, analogies, stories, cartoons, line drawings, diagrams interviews with experts, quotations from experts like Einstein or Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. And you put all of those things together and describers maybe 10 or 12 different words. If you look at those 10 or 12 different words, you'll be able to finish out your chapter. So you could start with your brand story and your signature story. Uh, we, they're interchangeable uh, terms. Mm -hmm. And then you can say, as Albert Einstein said, and here are some statistics from a research firm. And then you're telling a more complete story that, it, that works with them emotionally and logically. And you prove your point. So that way they get to know, like, and trust you. Yeah, and it's texture to the book as well. I love exactly. That. I love that. Exactly. So the name of your newest book is Write Your Book in a Flash. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And I call it a paint by numbers system, because everyone likes the system, yeah. for writing the book of your dreams fast. Mm -hmm. And the reason I call it that is because a lot, when you remember, think back when you were a kid, you had this paint by numbers kit, mm -hmm. and you weren't a great artist, but you could fill in the blanks. You know, mm -hmm. here had this, this easel, this canvas with, you know, numbers, you know, three is green, and four is dark green, and five is light green, and you were drawing a tree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just stay in the lines, you were okay. I think writing a book is as simple as that. Because every book should have, for example, 10 chapters. First chapter tells them what you're going to tell them. Last chapter tells them what you told them and tells them what, you, what they should do in the future, which is hire me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or if it's an advocacy book, call your representatives, do these things, mm -hmm. whatever. And the eight chapters in the middle prove your points. Mm -hmm. So if you say, gee, that sounds pretty simple. Why didn't I think of that? Well, I did. So, <laughs> so I put it into a book. I've written 13 books. I figured out how to write books mm -hmm. fast. Mm -hmm. And this is a way of writing books fast. Because if you have those 10 chapters outlined like that, mm -hmm. and you say, this is doable. I don't, because some people say, well, I don't, do you have 26 chapters? Do you have 42 chapters? Do you have mm -hmm. Now you have a framework, mm -hmm. and inside each of those 10 chapters, you have the describers. Mm -hmm. So you have your signature story, your brand story, and you follow up with those other describers that prove your point, and then you have your book written. And here's the other secret. You don't have to write it in order. So let's say, mm -hmm. I'm really strong on chapter three, but you know, I have to write chapters one and two first. No, 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 no. There are no rules like that. Mm -hmm. It's your book. You can do it whenever you feel like it. So if you have the, the, the excitement to say, I really want to write a book, uh, write the chapter on uh, employee engagement, mm -hmm. then you write it now. Or if you're writing two thirds, they say, I'll get to that third part later because I have to get a case study and I have to get permission from someone to quote them or whatever. I need to find a diagram. Well, I can do that later. And some days you have a different feel. You will have biorhythms, you know, high days, low days. No two days are the same. So you just go with the flow and say, you know, I really feel inspired to write chapter nine, subsection three, mm -hmm. and be done with it. And I tell you, if you just write 15 minutes a day, mm -hmm. you can have your book done in three or four months. It's as simple as that. I think that's a really great point because that is the biggest complaint I think people have is, I want to write this book, but I don't have the time. I don't have the time to do it, or I don't know how to start, I don't know how to organize my thoughts. So the having that step-by-step -step process is really key. Exactly. And you answered, you asked two questions there. Uh, being organized is going to save you a ton of time. That's mm -hmm. why I can confidently say in the title of my book, write your book fast. Mm -hmm. um, but also, 
You'll p p p when I do my, my webinars and my seminars, that is the number one question people ask is, I don't have the time to do this. Mm -hmm. Well, you make the time. You can, all I want is 15 minutes a day. If you mm -hmm. can't give me 15 minutes a day, then you're just not serious. Right. You can get up an hour earlier. You can stay up an hour later. And granted, people have kids, people have jobs, people commute, there's real life, people get sick. All that stuff happens, right. but you can watch an hour less of television. Right. You can take 45 minutes for lunch instead of an hour for lunch, and you write for 15 minutes, you get 500 words down there, and you've answered chapter nine, subsection three, it only needed 500 words, you're done. Right. And the next day, you're filling out another section, you go back to that paint by numbers picture, and you've just filled in all the clouds. Yeah. And to the next week, you're gonna fill in the trees, and then you're going for the, the ground, and then you're do, gonna do the house, right. and it all gets done, doesn't matter what order it gets done in, but it gets done because you have the outline to get it done. Yeah, and I also, I, so I wrote a book in January, mm -hmm. and it was, I had been contributing author for other books, but this was sort of my first thought leadership book, and I got an accountability partner, and we set a mm. deadline. So we met every week, we said, okay, this is what we're going to accomplish this week, yeah. and checked in, and we did, I did it in a month. That's fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations. So, thank you. But I wouldn't have probably finished that had I not had that accountability and a deadline. So. Um, you know, you know, you're checking in with somebody each time to say, "Did you write your chapters?" But I agree. You know, I have three kids, I have a business, I have a house. You just have to carve out the time and prioritize it. Yeah. If it's important to you, you will do it. Right. There's a business coach that I know, Christian Michelson. He says, "I have all the time in the world to do all the things that are truly important to me." Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, this is the greatest time management sentence ever because you're only doing the things that are truly important to you even if you're sloughing off and drinking coffee and reading a book or manicuring your nails that's what's most important to you at that moment even if you're procrastinating because you're not writing your book or shopping or mm -hmm. writing or doing whatever you else that is what we always default to what, what is most important to us we just have to say writing a book is really really important to me and I'm going to do it and if you can't get to that point then you shouldn't be writing a book yourself. You could be hiring a ghostwriter mm -hmm. to write the book for you, mm -hmm. which is perfectly done. And frankly, the biggest, darkest secret among many books that are written by thought leaders, and I say written by mm -hmm. thought leaders, mm -hmm. they're not written by thought leaders. They're written by ghost writers. Mm. Sometimes they get credit on the cover. <laughs> no, they're, they're, there's nothing wrong with this. You know, if you're, a, if you're a business executive or a coach or mm -hmm. a speaker and you're traveling and you don't have time to write the book, right. if you have three kids but you have these great ideas and you don't have time or you're closing these million dollar deals selling real estate or right. insurance policies or hedge funds or whatever, you know, hire someone who can do it for you because your time is more valuable. Mm -hmm. There are people who, who, who can write and can't do much else, mm -hmm. and that's what they are gifted at, and you're great at putting together hedge funds. That's what you should be doing. Uh, so there's no shame in that. You hire people to do all sorts of things for you. Why not hire them to write a book for you? Another way people can write books that they don't realize is they might be creating a lot of intellectual property right now. Mm -hmm. They might be blogging every week. You can mm -hmm. take those blogs and put them into a book. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe edit them a little bit. That's a perfectly fine way to write a book. You might have spoken. So you have transcripts, you have mm -hmm. PowerPoint presentations. You can put those into a book. I mean, there are books that are really just 50 or 100 pages long. In fact, I brought one with me today. I was at a conference in Boston recently. Mm -hmm. This is a book. Uh, by the world's leading uh, speaker on customer service. This guy is fantastic, uh, Chip Bell. And he gave his book out to everyone for free. And I looked at this book and I said, it's kind of small. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at it sideways and I said, it, it's, it's kind of thin. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't have many pages, but the pages in it are full of gold. And I believe that you could write a book like this in a weekend, mm -hmm. not even 15 minutes a day, just a couple of hours. These are probably all of his signature stories, yeah. those brand stories yeah. that are cute and interesting and inspiring. And this is probably written for the line people, mm -hmm. the people who are going to provide the customer service. Now, would the CEO look at this and say, is this guy a thought leader? No, they want the 300-page book. They want the research. They want the background. Uh, but the people who are at the front lines of the Hilton Hotels and the Wendy's uh, hamburgers and places like that, they're going to look at a book like this and say, Sprinkles, that's kind of fun. And then they look and they see bright colors and mm. oh, oh, a sentence on two pages here. 
Three <laughs> sentences. Yeah. You know, this is accessible to people today, especially with today's pe uh, short attention span where we're on Twitter and Facebook and you can say a lot in 128 characters. It's amazing how much you can say in 128 characters and that has trained our minds to say that I don't want to read a 400 page book anymore. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because uh, someone, someone when I was writing my book said stop calling it an e-book because I'm mm. getting both, I'm doing both. Yeah. But another person said, ebook is really the way that most books are going for the future. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something about um, like Amazon Library. I don't yeah. quite understand all that yeah. stuff. But do you have any thoughts about that? Are, are, is the ebook the way of the future? I mean, I, I'm never probably going to give up. I'm old school, the, like to hold something in yeah. my hand. But I think people do have that misconception that it's daunting to write, you know, a 200, 300, 400 page book. Well, you don't really need to. You can write that, that small book. Yeah. No one wants to read an encyclopedia anymore from mm -hmm. cover to cover. They want to find the information that helps them, and they're in, they're out, they're gone. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think as the future goes, we're going to see smaller and smaller books. In fact, I asked Chip Bell, is this the future? And he said, it most definitely is. So self-publishing is the future. You can write a book on your word processor, mm -hmm. save it as a PDF file, upload it to Amazon. I'm simplifying it a little yeah, bit, yeah. but it really is that simple. There, there's, there's services called CreateSpace that will look mm -hmm. at your book through a computer and say, oh, this page margin is off, fix this up. But once it's done, it converts it to a file that can be read on any Kindle or you know iPad. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're in business. And I've seen eBooks that are 27 pages. Mm -hmm. and it's like, really? But they were like $2.99, so I didn't feel ripped off. Yeah. And they presented enough information that made me know, like, and trust the author to say, she really knows what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of value out of this, mm -hmm. so that is good. So that's one way to answer the questions. There's nothing wrong with an ebook. Here's the second way to answer a question Your book in printed form is the best business card you will ever have mm -hmm. because it automatically says that you are an expert. And the other thing is, People don't throw away books. So the CEO or executive that, or the prospect you gave the book to, he, she's not going to throw it away. She's going to put it on her bookcase. Mm -hmm. And your name is going to be staring out at her every day. And maybe your picture, too. Hey, if it's thick enough, yes, you want to put your picture yeah. there, which is another tip. You want to have your book be a certain width so your mm -hmm. picture and your name stand out. And when she's ready to hire you, and it may be this month, it may be next month, it may be three years from now. Mm -hmm. We don't know when they're ready to hire us, but it's our job to be in touch with them so that when they are ready, they do buy from us. Right. And having that book on, the, on their bookshelf makes it a silent salesperson. So yes, you can have the book as an ebook, you can also turn it into a print book, either paperback or hardcover, and then you have your silent salesperson. That's amazing. Yeah. And so you've worked with a lot of high end um, executives and thought leaders, but you've also rubbed shoulders with some other pretty impressive people along your path. You, you know, you were in the trenches with Al Gore and the, <laughs> the development of the internet, but I read that you also interviewed some pretty high-level people as when you were doing journalism. Yeah, I interviewed uh, Gerald Ford and uh, First Lady Barbara Bush, who unfortunately just uh, just died the other day. Yeah. Uh, and, and it was really quite something. She, uh, being this close, actually closer to her than I am to you right now, she was speaking at the Indian River County Women's uh, Republican Club. Yeah. I was a reporter down there. I was in Florida, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the Vero Beach area. And uh, I uh, here's a funny story, actually. Um, it would have been so easy to say, here's what George Bush thinks about all these topics. Mm -hmm. And anyone could have written that story. You could read just to get his position papers. And I didn't want to do that. I figured, I have the candidate's wife here. And, and George Bush was not president then. He mm -hmm. was, you know, he was, there was, no there was no inkling that he had any inside lane on it than anyone else. So I thought, you know, it would be kind of fun to do a story about the candidate's wife. You know, they're on the road, they, they don't get much attention, it's always on the husband, it's, it's a man's game. I feel like, what's it like to be the woman behind the man and, you know, having to live in the same hotel rooms and the same rotten mm -hmm. schedule and whatever? Mm -hmm. So I'd say, so what do you think about topic A? And she would say, well, George thinks, blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, what do you think about 
this topic. And she said, well, George thinks, and no matter what I asked her, she always came back to, well, George thinks, and like, she is right on point. So I tried to like, I don't say trip her up. I'd like, how can I get this personal? I said, well, what do you like to do personally? Mm -hmm. like, Great, now I, now I can get this. She likes to bake cookies, or she likes to be with her grandchildren, or she likes whatever. She answered, well, George and I like to jog. Wow. So every, she was totally on point and totally focused, and the rest is history. Wow. So she, she could really tell a story, and that brand story, it was all about George and all of his positions, and it worked. Wow. And, you know, I'm sure in her personal life, obviously, it was yeah. her, she was very dedicated to her family, and the people that were around them in the White House always had stellar things to say about okay. her. But it was very savvy, very savvy for the campaign to have that brand message be consistent over and over and over again. Yeah. And that's something else that's important for everyone listening to mm -hmm. this podcast. It's like, when you talk to a reporter or or a prospect, really, you should have three things that you want to say. And you know that whatever they ask, you're going to come back to those three things because those three things will help them know, like, and trust you so they want to do business with you. Mm -hmm. See how I keep on coming back to that know, like, and trust? I'm also yeah. obnoxious about it. I have to stop that. Um, but you'd really be doing yourself a disservice if you left that interview, whether it be with a prospect or a reporter, and you didn't get your three points across. Now, it's up to them to accept them, to listen to them, to agree with them or not, but if you don't get your three points across, then you're doing yourself a disservice, because those are the three things that separate you from everyone else. Have you gotten your three points out yet? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's easy to write a book. Okay. You can do it, yeah. and a book will help you build your brand so you can charge higher prices because they know, like, and trust you. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> very good, very good. Well, I want to thank you so much for being here, and if people want to find out more about you, about y your books, about your system for writing books, how can they get in touch with you or find you online, since I'm sure you're on the internet? <laughs> <laughs> sure. My website is the name of the book. Write your book in a flash. You can go there and learn more about me and my writing services, my book coaching services, developmental editing and ghostwriting, or you can go directly to Amazon and get the book. It's cheap. Uh, <laughs> it's <so> valuable. <laughs> it's valuable. It's at a very low price. <laughs> you're right. It's not cheap. Thank you for the correction. We can all learn. Thank there you. you. You're welcome. You're welcome. But thank you so much for spending your time with us and sharing all this incredible expertise. I mean, if someone is out there and they want to build their brand, if they want to be seen as the thought leader, if they want to attract higher paying clients, get your book done, baby, right? I mean, that's the whole ticket. Or get someone to help you get your book done. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a brand strategist. I'm always saying lead with your superpowers. And if writing isn't your superpower, hire, hire Dan. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. One last question. I always ask. Uh oh what, what Here comes it, the zinger. Here, it's not too bad. What does it mean to you to thrive? Uh, thriving to me means the fact that this winter I skied 33 days. Whoa. I got up in the morning. I went to my yoga class, I did two hours of work answering emails, dealing with clients, whatever, then drove half an hour to Buck Hill, which is our local little ski area where Lindsey Vaughn learned how to ski, mm -hmm. ski for an hour or two, check my email there if anything is important. I rush back to the office. If not, I go down for a few more runs. Then I go back to the office in the afternoon, finish up client work, finish up any kind of emails, read a little bit, and then I'm done with my day. So thriving means that you control your day and your life. That's why we're in business, mm -hmm. to run the life that we want to live, not to live by someone else's rules. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's a fantastic definition, whether you ski or not, to live the life that you want to live. Right. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your time. Thank you. I'm so glad we met. Yeah, me too. And also thank you to, to all of you for joining us as well. And until next time, here's to hitting all your high notes. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.